this place that we all feel when we've been to Fugazi show, this like religious experience. Fugazi bashed down the doors. And they didn't just like, and they made break this down the doors. Are. There's the door. They kicked a hole in the wall. They just bypassed the door completely. The lexicon didn't exist. And I'm just like, what the fuck is this? Fugazi has been my favorite band since I heard them. He was James Brown. He was like the front man. It was crazy event. That hardcore scene was about equality anti-consumerism. It really spoke to me. I still think that Fugazi is the best band. This is Darwin. You'd like to say hello. He loves Fugazi too. I'm a surgeon and every password that I own has some version of Fugazi in it. It's my, it's my dead cat and Fugazi and people are always like, what? Well, you know, why are, why are you Frank Fugazi? Dude, well, I just blew away my my password, I guess. Uh, but, but I'm Frank Fugazi for everything. It's my dead cat. And, and, the, and the best name band in the world. Like I was telling my my neighbor, I'm like, yeah, I'm gonna go see a Fugazi cover band. They're like, what? I'm like, yeah, they're called Fugazi. It's fucking gonna be awesome. And I was like, and they're like, I was like, you've never heard of Fugazi? And of course, normal people, which is weird, don't know who the fuck they are. And you're like, dude, they're like the best band in the world, you know? <laughs> Was a, it was a long conversation between he and I, and, and it was kind of the, the consensus that, yeah, this, this music, it needs to be shared. This honestly was the best tour I've ever been on. I've been on a fucking shitload of shitty tours. To see other people, and then so many other people that felt as strongly as I do about that music was um, inspiring. We really were trying to bring the music to people, and so when people are saying, we want to hear this song, we want to hear that song, all right, let's do it. it How can we not play Repeater with Ducky on stage in Fresno? We've never played this before as a group. The energy was just phenomenal, and you could tell he loved being up there and participating. Suggestion in Oakland with Patricia on stage. Patricia and I have known each other for years. We've played music together. Uh, we've been friends for a really long time. Um, she's brilliant. Well, and she didn't just sing. I mean, she was, she was the movie. Movie. We were both dancing. It was like old times kind of thing, you know, um, 20 years later. It was really cool. I think the whole thing was just about spreading good music to those who maybe haven't heard it. It's amazing how many people didn't get to see Fugazi in their heyday. I had no idea. I guess I, in some ways, kind of took it for granted, maybe. And uh, so there's a lot of people now who either don't know who they are, which is a travesty, or just never got to see them and, and their eyes were open to it. So it was cool.
Republicans and they're just like, fuck religion, fuck capitalism, fuck all of these politics. It was really cool hanging out as a 14, 15 year old. <laughs> It's not like this is aggressive, like they're trying to prove their identity. There's no narcissism to it. For me, it was the um, anti-consumerism message was huge, um, which still resonates, I think. The independent spirit of, of making art and, and not about sort of commercializing it and commodifying it. And I mean, I feel like my first lessons and all that were from Fugazi. And I just found a way that I could express myself that wasn't negative. It was, it felt positive. And like that music, just really blended right into that. It's I started um, being a vegetarian. I started an Amnesty International student group at my high school. So it was just like a whole new <laughs> set of ideas coming from the small town where I grew up. How can we use our music to to make uh, the community which we're playing music to a better place? And to me, that's really inspiring. I think Fugazi has probably the number one influence on. Uh, my musicianship and the direction I've taken musically. Uh, also, on a lot of the my kind of core beliefs, I think Fugazi has, has played a tremendous influence. As a teenager, it was like, I want to be like that guy. I want to be in a band like this. And I really think emulated those guys and just wanted to do something like that. I mean, it really spoke to me. It's not only on a music level, but they just their lyrics meant something more than other bands I had listened to up to that point. Your, your worth and your value isn't based on what you have, it's who you are and how you treat people on a daily basis. Not only there's, you know, problems with the way we treat women, but that there are men who understand that. This is how you write songs, this is, this is how you're in a band, this is what you do, this is, these are your values, and it just, you know, it just stuck with me all these years, you know, all these, yeah. just, like every time I hear this music, it's just like, touches every happy point in my body. I got my first, like, real guitar, and I got a Gibson SG, and definitely, hands down, got it, because that's the guitar Ian had, and I want to be like Ian. I called in remote. Yeah and we were just talking about different things and it was mentioned that I like Fugazi and... I thought that, well, if, if she likes Fugazi then she's gotta be pretty cool, so <laughs> we're married now. I mean, if there's any band I'd like to turn anybody on to, it'd be, it'd be Fugazi for sure. We were blown away with how, with how humble they were, how nice they were, how gracious, and um, changed our lives forever, really. It, it showed us how you can in a band. The whole fucking business of punk rock is such a bummer and Ian just made that, brought it back to where it should be, you know. I, I really miss that. Discharge, crass and subhumans and bad religion and all these bands, you know, and, and great ideas. There was still something about Fugazi's engagement with the personal that made that stick. Whereas everything else felt poetic, or theoretical, inspiring in a way, but Fugazi you know, it was like church. Fugazi is like gods, basically. You know, they're the gods. Creative communion, you know? Like, that transcends geography, and then people are sharing ideas, and especially when there wasn't the internet. When you could just, it was just seven inches and dubbed tape cassettes and like, enthusiasm. My best friend, Wit Sibley, made me a mixtape. I was in the back seat of a friend's car on my way to go skateboarding. I was in my friend Scott's Volvo station wagon. And he played me a cassette. Actually in his car on the way home to go and play some music to jam. I put it in a escape video I made. We're driving down the highway. We're listening to the tape copy of the first record. And half of my punk friends, you know, and we're all babies, it didn't sound like punk to them, they didn't get it. It was so far beyond, you know, the standard punk rock. There was so much bass, there was so much groove. It felt like, well, we were just trying to figure out what terminology to use. It didn't go in the metal direction, it didn't even go in like the weird new wave direction. It was just it completely invented their own genre. You know, Washington DC invented hardcore and then 
years pass and things happen and Revolution Summer happens and then what happens after that? And this is the thing that happened after that. It wasn't just three chord punk anymore. Yeah. It was a little bit, they went further. Discord as a label was just this incredible influence on me. Fugazi, Jawbox, Lungfish. I mean, I could list, you know, 10 bands. Circus Lupus, Ignition, Minor Threat. For me, those like those recordings, they were all they were very awkward because I, you know, those songs had seemed so huge on stage, and then putting them in the laboratory, it's you know that's the thing about recording. It's it's a very strange thing. You know, you're taking these these like really living, breathing things, and then putting them into essentially a very artificial environment. And what you're creating is actually sonic illusion because what you the end result is that they're but the sound coming out of these like your tiny little speakers are somehow going to move you the same way if you were standing in a, in a room with the band actually playing. But I mean, how can that be? You know, you're not if you're not in the room with 500 other people and it's just sweat falling off the walls and like you can feel the low end. You know, you're not. But so there's, it's always sonic illusion. If I could only have one album, it'd be 13 songs. 13 songs. 13 songs. Repeater. 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 Oh, repeater. Repeater. My brain says repeater. Oh man. The repeater. Repeater. <laughs> Seems silly to pick anything else. <laughs> I really love steady diet of nothing. Steady diet of nothing. Steady diet of nothing. Steady diet of nothing. Steady diet is my favorite. Steady diet of nothing, my friend. I don't know if I could pick one. I in on the kill taker. 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 In on the kill taker is absolutely by far my favorite record. You know, probably. If I could only have one Fugazi album, it would be Red Medicine. Red Medicine. Instrument Hill Track. Every new record, it was like, oh, and this one's my favorite. Oh, now this one's my favorite. End hits. Currently, it's probably end hits. Uh, but I think End Hits is the one I, I couldn't live without. My heart says The Argument. The Argument. The Argument, by far. It's, yeah. it's, it's incredible. The Argument. But I'm already regretting that answer. <laughs> the Argument. I, I love them all, but they, they always got better, so I guess it has to be the most recent. Yeah. I mean, have they ever put out a rotten record? No. They don't have a bad album. There's not a bad album. I want, from the beginning, the compilation, the DC Benefit compilation, through Margin Walker, through 13 songs. Like, I want it all. Like, yeah. cause, because it's my history in life. And Margin Walker was a weird sounding record for us, but that was John's vision. Hmm. But it was fine, because somebody else was making that call. And then we did Repeater. I actually think Repeater was actually, stylistically, pretty... There was a lot of um, production involved there. Like, you know, I know, I know the song Repeater, for instance, we were really thinking about hip hop. That record was just the four of us. And we all were sitting like, well, what do we do? What do we do? And then someone's like, well, we just, let's do nothing. And so that's really where that record, I mean, it's weird, that record is just so dry. And then we came back to Ted and, and Killtaker because I think we were so flummoxed by the steady diet thing. And we had tried it with Albini and that didn't work at all. In all these cases, like the thing that was missing was we couldn't play the studio the way we would play the stage. And I think Red Medicine was the first time that we figured it out. It was the first time where we went in the studio and we just hit it the same way we would hit a stage. And it was great. The, the instrument record has always been the one that I feel the most connected to because that's actually, that's us. But I think the last three records, in terms of recording, for me at least, they were like the most interesting sounding. All through the band, but especially in the beginning, you know, we had this, we, we had a mantra, which is, you know, the record is the menu and the show is the meal. So what we were trying to do is give people a blueprint of what the songs are, but then they hear them live and go, oh, fuck, I get it. One of my first shows I ever went to, I think it was probably 88, 89, it was a Fugazi show here in uh, Phoenix uh, at a VFW hall. Um, you know, I mean, obviously at that time it was funny, you know, I remember like uh, being piled in a car with all my friends, my dad, you know, dropping, uh, dropping us off at the show and saying, don't tell your mom uh, where we're dropping you off, because this was like, you know, it was in the hood. In 89, Speedway Cafe here in Salt Lake City, it was monumental. 
you know, I never felt such energy at a show, and it was it was a positive energy. It was it was it was aggressive, but it wasn't violent. Twenty three hundred one Canton. I want to say this was nineteen ninety. The uh, fire marshal came in with a whole conga line of cops and firefighters, and and basically they got into an argument on the stage, and then they kicked everybody out for breaking the fire code. And so there's this sea of people outside of this venue, and there's um, you know warring factions of the skinhead sort of uh, ilk, and um, so there's fights and there's all kinds of crazy stuff going on. And there's a U-Haul, I believe, that Fugazi had brought, you know, they're driven or whatever, and uh, so they're playing in the warehouse while we're all outside. And, I mean, to their credit, they were amazing. They played their fucking heart out to no one. For like, they played like two or three songs and then they'd, they'd stop and like come and like interact with people between the, the gate, between the fence, like this you know, sort of fenced gate. And then go back and play some more. And people are stage diving off the U-Haul and stuff like that. I mean, it was unbelievable. It was almost something that should have been written into a book. And then, many years later, I was reading uh, Our Band Could Be Your Life. And there it is. There's an interview with Ian Mackay, and he's talking about this show. And I was just, it was electrifying again. I was like, I was there. No way, you know? Like, that's awesome. Somebody wrote about that experience. It was a matinee show <laughs> at Pearl Street in Northampton, Massachusetts. Nice. And it was 2 in the afternoon, 2,000 kids showing up. It's just, this place is packed, it's sold out. I first saw them live in 1990 at a place called The Library in Knoxville, Tennessee. My favorite Fugazi show was in Nantes, France. I saw Fugazi at Fort Mason for $5. My first Fugazi show was at the Shrine Auditorium in LA. 95 at the Shrine Auditorium. Kind of a legendary show at the Shrine in LA, and that was with Unwound and Blonde Redhead. Probably my favorite Fugazi show was the Food Not Bombs 20th anniversary show in San Francisco. Fugazi and Sleater Kinney for free, Dolores Park. Fugazi played in Dolores Park for free. Um, I remember that show just being uh, just incredible. And I want to say that's the last time that I saw them play. When I saw them, I was. I was. I. I <laughs> I almost cried a little bit. I was like, I've been waiting for this forever, forever. Then we played a show at this place called the Silver Dollar. Which... It was at a club called the Silver Dollar Club, which is a total shithole in downtown Phoenix before. So sketchy down there. There was like a pit that broke out. He was like, you know, stop it, stop it, stop the show. And like, actually made the crowd pick up the fence between the security and the front. And pick up the fence and move the fence out of the way. <laughs> Police helicopters above. But halfway through the set, uh, Ian falls through the stage. And like, I've seen him talk about this show too. In which I actually fell through the stage because it was rotten wood. Well, it's true, like all the way to his waist. And he keeps playing guitar and he comes over and just kicks the mic stand down so the mic just falls. And they just play, finish the whole song <laughs> with him in the stage. <laughs> that was the first show, which was awesome. At a $5 ticket, it doesn't weed out any of the riffraff. The riffraff are attracted to a $5 ticket. Ian McKay was like, no mosh pitting! I don't want any stage diving, I don't want any crowd surfing, you know, nobody's here to get their head walked on. Yeah. And Mackay was like, no fucking slam dancing. And I was like, I'm not slam dancing, bro, I'm just having fun. Dancing like you. I got on a friend's shoulders and Ian stopped the show because he was distracted by me on, on my friend's shoulders. And uh, I remember this kid got up on stage like, you know, a few songs in, and he got up on stage and he's about to stage dive, and Ian like mutes his guitar and he grabs the kid by the shirt, pulls him into him, and he's like, what did I just fucking say? Right? And the kid's just like deer in the headlights, like, holy shit, Ian McKay's fucking yelling at me. Like, what do I do, you know? I didn't kick him out or nothing, but I was just like, holy shit, this is real, you know? And, uh, and then for two more hours, they just, just exploded and just fucking killed it, you know? Blew me away. It's one of the best shows I've ever seen. Security guards probably shouldn't have been working the Fugazi show at the Fugazi show, mm -hmm. you know? And some of the crowd was getting roughed up, and it wasn't good, and Ian noticed. 
When Mankai tells you to fucking calm down, you calm down and listen. And he's like, hey, stop the show. And, you know, you can't be here. You, sir, have the night off work. You, sir, have the night off work. You know, doing this thing, like, for, like he did like six years before that with the kids who wanted minor threat songs. He's like, you can go home now. I got you, you know? Like, kind of like a father, you know? Like, and not even a jerky dad, but like a, a cool dad. Um, he, uh... He says like, all right, we never do this, but because those security guards beat those kids up and ruin this part of this song, we're gonna play the song again, and it was great cop. So they played it not once, but twice, and everyone stage dove. And Ian didn't shut it down, and he let us dance. And it was like this really crazy moment where it was like, you know, and people were doing wild stages. I was like, like, like quintuple flips, like 28 yards across the crowd. It was like beautiful stuff. If you like that, you know? And maybe for that moment, Ian even liked that. I don't know. The first time I saw them was for In on the Kill Taker in Hollywood at the Palladium. That show at the Palladium, they kicked somebody out and gave them the $5, you know? Yeah. Yeah. They had the envelope, you know? <laughs> it was cool. It was a packed show, I remember, and uh, Keanu Reeves was standing behind me, and he was kind of like at the height of his, you know? And so that was, he was trying to, he was trying to hide. He, I remember he had like, like a fedora or something. He was like, like typical spy trying to hide a trench coat, hot collar. <clears throat> but, uh, so that was kind of, that was kind of funny. And then that was the first time I ever saw a shoe thrown up, you know. I'd heard stories, but sure as shit, someone decided I'm going to do this and throw a shoe. Screeched halt the whole thing and, you know, kicked the guy out, gave him his six bucks back. And it was just kind of, not typical, but it was like, Okay, this really happens. I heard about it, and here we are. It's happening. Yeah, don't be a dick at our show. Like, there's nothing wrong with asking people not to be macho assholes. I think this is the fifth time we've been to Phoenix. At the Celebrity Theater. Celebrity Theater. Well, first off, Celebrity Theater here is really cool. It's got a uh, rotating stage. Every fucking time we come here, it's just got to be some insane setting. So it was six dollars instead of five dollars. Uh, I think he uh, apologized a couple of times throughout the show for inflation. Uh, I, I specifically remember because it was the same for a beer. One beer was the same cost as a mission to the show. Some jackass do something on stage. You really cannot imagine. Threw a drink on the stage. Somebody threw a beer, and I think it hit Ian or somebody, and they stopped. Stage stop. Music stop. Sir, can you come up here and clean up your mess? Sir? Where's the guy who the beer? And everybody, uh, he's right here, he singled the guy out real quick. But I remember it being a pretty civil interaction. Like, not a ton of anger, just sort of like, hey, dude, that's not cool. You spilled beer on the stage. Come clean that up. Stop the fucking set. Come pick that up. Come clean it up. Here's a rag. Made him come up on stage and clean the fucking floor where all this shit was. He pulls out his wallet and gives him his six bucks back, and he's like, you gotta go. And then he's like, now get this motherfucker out of this place, dude, and kicked him out. <laughs> Which I thought was cool. I always, I always personally respected the, uh, Let's all be chill and not hurt each other uh, attitude. Oh, and then I also remember John Frusciante was the guitar tech for that show. I remember him, you know, sort of inviting all of us to go to the next show which is in Tupa City, Arizona, which is up on the Navajo Reservation. Which is, I mean, it's, the fact that they played there was awesome, you know? And I think they were playing in like a high school auditorium or something. And the story that I got from somebody there was that some kid at the school had written Fugazi a letter and asking them to play at their school. And said, you know, no good shows ever come through where I live. And Fugazi did it, which I was just like, wow, that's so cool. These guys are, Walking the talk. And uh, the show was great. It was in the gymnasium slash auditorium of this high school. The high school used to be a boarding school, so they actually like rented us a room, a dorm room, to spend the night in, because there's not really any hotels in Tuba City. And the uh, show was great. I was sitting on the stage, basically, at Ian's feet. 
Uh, but it was great and amazing and still one of the best concerts of my whole life. They were so amazing because they would just go into one song, like one song, and then it would be like this kind of falling apart, like noisy thing into the next song. I remember Fugazi's set was was really, really stellar. It really impressed us how they went from song to song um, seamlessly without a set list. They were just kind of magical. And, and every piece of every song fit like a jigsaw, and there wasn't. There, there weren't any harsh edges, there weren't any stop starts, there weren't any track spacings in the set lists. And I was like, how do they know what's happening? Are they looking at each other's hands? What does that mean? Did Guy just breathe and they went into that song? How did they know that breath meant that? Like, me and my friends who had been in bands at this point and like understood that language and that chemistry, it still was something different. It was so beyond anything we'd known. We would practice like that. And the idea was just to be very in the moment always so we just go from one thing to the next to the next without having to stop and talk all the time It was always different, but it was always a real experience. The whole performance was sincere, and that's what connects, and that's that's the lasting impact. You lose the minutia of the politics, of the time, and and the you know whatever reference they use to introduce songs. But the fact that the fact that it was remarkably obvious that these guys cared so much about the music um, yeah. that it was something different than other shows I've been to. But I just remember every time walking walking away, anytime I ever saw that band, just still in a daze the, the next day, you know, just kind of chewing on it. They left you something to kind of, you would sink your teeth into it, you know. Um, it was always this feeling of like, we're all here together. All of us in the band and all of you in the audience, we are all on the same field and, um, we're all having this shared night together. And I always thought that was so cool and I've never really seen another band um, pull that off and, and make you feel that way. My dad answers the phone and he's like, Ian's on the phone or something, <laughs> you know? And so I think it's Brian or someone completely shitting me and so I answer the phone, I'm like, hey. He's like, hey, this is Ian Mackay. I'm like, yeah. And so I'm totally rude to him. <laughs> and I'm so, like, right. And then, I don't know, I think Ian starts reading my email back to me. And by the time, I'm like, oh, fuck. Like, shit, this is really Ian Mackay. No one else has read that email. Like, not even my bandmates know that I really sent this email. Oh, out. yeah, we didn't know, no, by the no, way. No, I just did it. <laughs> Yoon just went ahead and, and did this, and we had no idea. Because so. I didn't think it would work, and I didn't yeah. think I would have to tell them about it. Right? right. And then he asks if we want to play, and that's how we got the show. Of course, before the show, we met the guys in Fugazi, and they were great. Um, Brennan was super friendly, and... It was just um, cool to meet our idols because we had—they were absolutely our favorite band, and we were completely influenced by, by them. He gave us a tour of the house. The part of the the tour that was kind of neat was just like you know you go in the basement of that house, and I don't know, right? Been there. It was like there was not a lot of room that they'd be standing in between the rafters. Like their heads would have to fit in the rafters of the floor because it's so small. As well known and popular as they ever were, they were always really accessible. I think I wrote a letter to Discord when I was like 14 and somebody wrote back, Amy, I believe. Amy wrote me back 
in like a handwritten note. And I was like, whoa, that's amazing. Paul Kane and I drove out to Wyoming. I think they were playing Laramie. Um, and this is after we had met them because then um, during the show, Ian looks over at me. He's like, what do you want to hear next? <laughs> <laughs> like, you shouldn't That's be talking awesome. to me now. That's hilarious. What are you doing? Um, I remember one of my friends was like, Oh, shit, I can't believe I'm hanging out with Ian McKay. <laughs> and he's like, Actually, it's McKay. And he's like, Oh, I can't believe I just got corrected by Ian McKay. What was so great is that it's not. it wasn't disappointing to meet someone that you have always looked up to. Yeah. It was, Wow, they are actually that cool and really mm -hmm. nice and respectful and mm -hmm. enthusiastic about new music and I don't know. Yeah, it was pretty great. And I had this really important decision to make. Uh, Elliot Smith was playing a secret show at Satyricon that night. Uh, I hadn't seen Fugazi since 1991. And I had to decide, am I going to go see Fugazi at the Crystal Ballroom? Am I going to go see the secret Elliot Smith show at Satyricon? About two days before the show, I run into Elliot and I start talking to him and he says, and I tell him the story about how I had to make this huge decision, this life decision. Who am I gonna see, Fugazi or L.A. Smith? Uh, I didn't realize it was gonna be Fugazi's last show in Portland, ever. Uh, L.A. said, oh, I'm sure you chose Fugazi. And I said, no, I chose you. And he said, you should have chosen Fugazi. And I get a call out of the blue. I answer the phone, I numbskull, you know, at the office. And the voice on the end's all, yeah, I want to speak to Eddie. And I'm all speaking. This is Ian McKay from Fugazi. And I'm like, I'm all, fuck you, Paul. I, I hung up on him, because I had this buddy, Paul, that would totally, like, just clown me all the time. Um, and prank call me and tape him, and then I'd become the butt of jokes, kind of like in a jerky boy style. And then, the the number shows up again, and then I, and I answer it, and I'm like, well, hey, numb's gone, and he's like, why'd you hang up on me? And it turned out it was Ian, like, for reals, and I'm like, holy shit, you know? And then he's like, yeah, I heard that, you know, um, I want to do some shows, heard you're the guy. And so we talked, and I was still, like, in a state of shock. Even when I hung up the phone, I think I kind of did, like, a little dance and shit, but it's still, the, the gravity of it just didn't really hit, you know? In 1998, we were doing this West Coast tour and we were playing in Salt Lake City. The night before the show, we were flying at a different show, see if we could get some people to go. And um, this guy there came over to our bassist, Josh Kennedy, and recognized his Possum Dixon t-shirt. And they started talking about Possum Dixon and um, hit it off. And we invited Eddie to come to the show the next night. Eddie came loved the show, and the guy who booked the show and, and put it on was this guy named Eric Bliss. A couple days later we went out to California and met uh, Keith Kurtz in Berkeley for the first time at a, at a show at the Punks with Presses warehouse. After that Punks with Presses show we were staying with our friend Andy Camp and we got a call from Eddie and he offered us um, a show to play with Fugazi in six weeks. Of course we said yes. And we did the here. It was February 19th, 1999. It was a sold out show and these punkers wanted to see the show so badly that they climbed up the back of the building that was a fire escape with ladder. Super shady and precarious. And they got up there and like shimmied their way onto the dome roof, which is just basically tar paper. I've been up there, it's like it's the last place you want to be. <laughs> and they like punctured it and ripped out a huge panel right over the stage. So they couldn't get in, the tickets were sold out, and they were trying to sneak in here, and no one could let them in. So they watched the show, literally like looking at the scalps of them from up there, and then the theater had to go up the next day and repair all the damage. I saw Ian, and I was like, hey, you know, hey, you know, Eddie said I can videotape you guys if I had cameras, I cool with you guys. And he was just like, you know, as long as you're not in my way, in our way, like, you're totally fine. So I ran to my old my work at the good guys and borrowed a video camera for the night. If you're gonna remember Fugazi, they're gonna be known for doing it themselves. I mean this is a band that 
recorded, played, booked, accounted, carried their own shit. You can't even help them with an amp. <laughs> you know, drove, they did everything by themselves. So I think the, the DIY aspect and then the work ethic are part of their legacy for sure. Playing what they wanted to play, uh, saying what they wanted to say, charging what they wanted to charge at the door so their fans could actually get in. This set a standard, a model, that I'm frankly still trying to repeat in my life today. It's huge. Uh, it can't be overstated. This is our, currently our 25th year, and I think we've done something like over 5,000 shows in that neighborhood. And to this day, there isn't a band that has been more influential or had more impact than Fugazi. People cover Fugazi songs, and ironically, like one of the most covered songs is uh, I'm So Tired, a song that was only played one time on the piano by me and Brendan on drums. And it was never performed live. It was never a Fugazi song, really. It was just something I had written, brought to the band, and it was sort of like people were like, nah, not going to think how that's going to work for us. And then it just ended up on the instrument record because of the, it was in the movie. And there's a young woman who does a ukulele version of it. I, I just blows my mind. And that, I don't know if pride is the right word, but it really made me happy. Like, you know, 25 years or so after I had this idea that somebody who I'd never met, who was much younger than me, would be tickled, you know, or poked by the music in a way that would, would then provoke her to, to do that. I understand, because music tickled and poked me the same way.
Still, I was gone.